Hello and welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by Scott on the Big Picture. My name is James Shooter and I'm part of the management team at the charity and tonight I'm in discussion with David Barkley from Saving Wildcats. Now we've got a whole host of questions to get through tonight uh, but if you'd like to get involved then please feel free to do so. Um, the comments box is disabled tonight um, so if you have any then please channel them through the Q&A box and even if you don't have a question it's worth keeping that box open um, for if a question comes in that you particularly like the look of you can give it a thumbs up and it will boost it up the list and be more likely to be asked at the end of the, the end of the evening. So wildlife comeback is a key part of rewilding. Um, returning missing or threatened species can really help fix broken ecosystems and restore natural processes. So I'm particularly excited to talk to Dave tonight about saving wildcats and their exciting project to return one of Scotland's most iconic native species. So without further ado, welcome Dave. Hi, James. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Fantastic. So we've got lots to get through, so I'll uh, jump right in. But I'm always interested in kind of people and their backgrounds, and you've got a particularly exciting kind of role as ex situ conservation manager at Saving Wildcats. So who are you, what do you do, and how did you end up there? Uh, well, as you say, my name's uh, David, David Barclay, and I'm ex situ conservation manager for Saving Wildcats. Um, I think it's quite fair to say I've, I've had quite a fortunate um, career. Um, I've worked for the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, who are, are the lead partner in saving wildcats um, for about 18 years. Um, I've always been interested in carnivores and even more specifically in, in the cat family. Um, and I've been really privileged over those 18 years to work hands on with many different cat species uh, to be involved in uh, different um, breeding programs and different uh, conservation projects and research projects. Um, and over the last sort of, uh, five to 10 years, um, a lot of that has been focused on, on wild cats and other small cats um, in the cat family. So um, like I say, very fortunate and I'm just really delighted to be able to use that sort of combination of skills and experience to do everything we can to help save uh, this iconic cat. Yeah, it's a fantastic kind of position to be in and uh, exciting work you guys are doing. Um, my first kind of proper question um, should be a simple one, but nothing is simple with, with wildcats. So what is what is a wildcat? Tell us what it is. Well, the wildcats are a wild uh, native cat species um, to Scotland and, and the UK. I mean, um, it wasn't too long ago that the wild cat was found found across the UK, but it, it's a wild cat species. It's it's not a domestic cat. Um, you know there there are similarities um, because domestic cats predominantly uh, descended from African and Asian wild cats, so there's similarities. Um, but it's it's a true wild cat species um, in the cat family. Um, you know the tigers, the lions, the leopards are the, are a cousin of of the wild cat. And it's a species that, um, you know, is, is quite symbolic in, in terms of uh, Scotland's wild nature. Um, it's deeply ingrained into Scottish culture. Um, and it's incredibly sad um, that, that the wildcat plight um, over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and of course, it's, it's a species that we don't feel that we, we should lose and we should do everything we can to conserve this amazing species. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you say, um, that kind of, you know, wild cats aren't the same as kind of domestic cats. So kind of how do they differ? And, and you know, what's the, I suppose, the, the different roles in the ecosystem they might perform to these kind of feral or domestic cats? How do they stand out? Well, I mean, I think it's important that, you know, to look at all cats um, and, and to be aware that, of course, there are similarities. Um, you look at the behavior of tigers and, and lions and snow leopards and jaguars, and most of those behaviors you'll see in your domestic cat. Um, they've got a lot of the same play behavior, you know, cats in, in general are solitary cats. Um, so there, there's lots of similarities, but um, like I say, the, the wild cat is um, a wild living species in Scotland. The domestic cat is a different species that serves obviously a different role and, and different function. I mean, 
domestic cats have been bred to be uh, the companion of, of humans. They're bred to be animals that are quite comfortable in, in houses being fed domestic cat food. And wild cats are, are out there in what is a very hostile environment in Scotland, especially in the north of Scotland. Um, they're solitary cats. They, they have to hunt and kill to find their, to stay alive. Um, and of course, domestic cats, and even feral cats, and of course they, they come into the equation, which are just wild living domestic cats. They play a slightly different role as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're different. There's, they're, again, there's simil similarities in some of the, the markings because as I've, as I've mentioned, um, domestic cats have, have descended from um, African and Asian wild cats. So, a typical tabby domestic cat will have some similar markings to a wild cat and that adds to the confusion and adds to the challenges and the complexities of trying to conserve a species like this. And as we all know, there, there's crossbreeding, um, which is one of the biggest threats to, um, to the future of wild cats, um, crossbreeding between the domestic cat and the wild cat. And that compounds the issue because it means that the offspring exhibit both traits of, of a wild cat and the domestic cat and it, it confuses and muddies the waters in terms of conservation making it uh, much more difficult um, but you know looking at them as two separate species one is our our native cat that's um, on the brink of extinction the other is one that's been bred to be man uh, man's companion they're two completely different animals um, and they have two completely different um, functions but we have to, like I say, be aware that there's a lot of similarities as well. So there must be, I guess, quite a lot of probably confusion, even amongst experts about kind of, you know, the, 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 the exact kind of specific um, uh, definition of what a wildcat is, kind of looking at it, uh, how it looks, how it behaves, especially when this hybridization comes into um, the kind of uh, situation. I guess in part that's probably why we've got to this um, this kind of uh, state of affairs is that you know I guess uh, up until recently with advances in technology and stuff we we probably didn't know exactly what we were saving because the the this hybridizations happened so so bad so I mean the current situation the crux of it at the minute is that the situation is best at best described as dire in Scotland. So how, how has it got to this? Obviously, hybridization is an issue, but what other kind of historic kind of um, uh, problems has there been? Well, I mean, the, the, there's been a few peaks and troughs in terms of the, the historic wildcat population. Um, and we know since the sort of uh, late 19th century that the wildcat population was really restricted to the uh, to northern northern Scotland. And over time, um, there's been multiple threats. There's been persecution. Um, there's been habitat loss, there's been prey decline. Um, and of course, more recently in the, in the last sort of two to three decades, we've seen the, the issues of hybridization become uh, a much bigger problem. But they're, they're sort of almost a, a, a secondary issue um, because if obviously if you have a big healthy wildcat population, um, as, as is found across Europe in some areas, you, you tend to find, although there's still a feral domestic cat presence, that that wildcats want to keep themselves um, to themselves. But as the population gets smaller and more fragmented and we get into the breeding season, you know, it's very unlikely that a wildcat is going to walk 200 miles just to find um, another wildcat to mate with. When there's, you know, 100, 200 domestic or feral cats in between those two animals, it will mate with all of the other ones on the way. So it's, it's a, a, an issue that's been sort of compounded by um, the breakdown of, of that stable population. Um, but I think historically, there's no getting away from the fact that, um, that persecution played, played a big role. And we see sort of, um, as I say, peaks and troughs in, in the population, depending on some of the um, activities. And for example, war, during the war, there was, there was a bit of recovery in the population. Um, and after that, when sort of land management or some of the, the activities in the, the, the highlands of Scotland sort of went back to normal, the population um, uh, declined again. So, you know, I think, I think in my opinion, it's, it's a bit like buckaroo. You know, a population can withstand a number of threats, but every time, every time you add another threat to that population and it gets smaller and smaller, 
you know, it passes a point of no return um, and the whole system collapses. And that's what we've really seen with wildcats. The population has got so low that it's just, it just, it's just not viable anymore. Um, and and we're, a, we're, we're in a, a really, really serious situation um, if we want to save the species, species for future generations. And there comes a point where there's just very few options on the table. Um, and that's really where we arrived a, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, I think you, you touched on, on the fact about confusion and so on. And I, I, I agree that I think historically that's, it's been part of the problem because, you know, we, there's been many, many surveys in the last sort of 10 uh, to 20 years. Um, not too many, but there's, there's been several surveys um, across the last decade or two. Um, and a lot of them were involving um, sort of surveys through communities to see if people had seen wildcats. Um, surveys using camera traps um, or sightings and a lot of that is is in fact all of that is based on the image of a cat and we know in the last five to ten years that there's many many cats out there that look like wild cats but are actually uh, hybrids and, and quite extensive hybrids at that so we know that just by looking at a cat it's not enough to be able to sort of confidently say that that's a wild cat that we want to conserve versus a, a hybrid that perhaps we, we wouldn't want to. And, and again, you touched on technology and we've gone through several advances and one being the ability to take a genetic sample and test it. And that allows us to see the extent of hybridization. Um, so it has been quite a complicated history, which um, has, has made um, conservation efforts uh, very difficult, but some of those advances in the last few years are, are, are really critical now to how we move forward. Well, I've never, I've never heard um, Buckaroo being brought into a uh, conservation anecdote before, but well done on that. That was, that was, that was nice. <laughs> well, nice I, I, I tried to take quite a complex issue and, and simpl simplify it, but um, in my uh, head anyway, and that's a weird head to get into, but in my head, <laughs> it, it, it makes sense. Uh, that's uh, conservation communication at the best when you can kind of simplify uh, complex science and turn it into a kid's game. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, saving wildcats. So this is a, a, a follow-up project to, to Scottish Wildcat Action, um, the kind of previous initiative that I guess had some of the same people and some of the same partners. Um, so how did that kind of initial um, organisation lay the ground for this project? And, and was it successful? And, and how does saving wildcats now differ from that setup? Um, okay, well, I mean, in, in short, I would say that, that yes, the, the the first project, um, Scottish Wildcat Action, was successful um, for, for different reasons. Of course, there was, there was many challenges, um, but, but fundamentally what that project told us um, is that the, it gave us a much more realistic picture of um, the current status of wildcats. And I think that's critical because the project, Scot Scottish Wildcat Action, started off quite optimistically um, under the assumption based on the available data at the time. And of course, um, we always try and, we're always trying to be led by the evidence and, and take a scientific approach. Um, so based on the data at the time, it was suggesting that there's still small but, small but healthy or viable populations left in Scotland and that we could conserve them by carrying out a, a range of field activities, threat reduction, um, uh, improving habitats, uh, you know, carrying out cameras, uh, camera surveys to get a better idea of uh, the, the number of um, wildcats in those populations, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a huge amount of community engagement um, that really raised the profile for the species. Um, so it was, it was good on many, many fronts. But what, what the field work did in Scottish uh, Wildcat Action was collect a huge amount of data that we could then put on the table and, and, as I say, get a much more realistic picture of what the, the status was of wildcats. And it was in about the third year when we'd been um, camera trapping, we'd been live trapping some cats and collecting hair samples um, and, you know, trapping uh, feral hybrids to neuter them to reduce the threat to wildcats, that we started to find something quite interesting. And it was that some of the best looking wildcats that we were catching on camera traps 
when we genetically tested them, were actually coming back as, as mediocre hybrids. Um, and, and the whole sort of genetic sampling um, can be quite complicated, but um, in a nutshell, we decided at the start of that project that um, when, we, when we developed a genetic test, we would um, set a sort of benchmark for what, what we would, what level of hybridization we would deem as being manageable in terms of um, defining what a wildcat is versus a hybrid. And, and that, that was 75% wildcat, which, which meant that if a cat tested at 75% on the genetic test, um, then it would equate to one grandparent was a domestic cat and three grandparents were wild cats. Um, and, and some actually felt that was quite um, pessimistic at the time, but nevertheless, uh, we, we went ahead. Some, some felt that that benchmark should be higher. Um, but what we found through the field work with Scottish Wildcat Action was that a lot of cats, in fact, all the cats we were testing, regardless of how good they looked like a wild cat, we're not meeting that that sort of um, that uh, genetic threshold, so to speak, where that we would that we would comfortably call that cat a wild cat, and and we sort of we started to realise that actually the problem here is that there's lots of cats out there that look like wild cats, but when you scratch away at the surface and you don't just take what the cat looks like as um, the sort of defining a, a characteristic, and you look at the genetics, then we're we're losing the wildcats through genetic introgression. In fact, arguably we've we've lost most of the wildcat through genetic introgression. So you know we could we could move forward and we could say you know there's a there's a population of wildcats out there. Here's loads of pictures of cats that have got tabby marks and a bushy tail. But deep down we know because we've we've got the evidence that that almost all of those cats. Will not be will not be sort of um, wild cats with a low level of hybridization. They'll, they'll be hybrids. And of course, we want to save wild cats. We don't want to save sort of half wild cat, half domestic cat. We want to retain as much of the wild cat as we can, both its behaviors, its looks, its genetics, and so on. That's what we want to capture, and we want to create viable populations for in the future. Um, so. So I think purely from that, that perspective, the project was, was very successful. But of course, when we had that data, we started to realize that the approach that we started off with wasn't the approach that's needed to be able to conserve wildcats moving forward. So we asked, um, we gave all of our data and asked for an independent review by the IUC and cat specialist group um, who are you know, the leading, leading authority on, on conservation issues. And they carried out a, a wildcat status review, which looked at all of the data, historic and current, and um, all of the activities that Scottish Wildcat Action had been doing, and reviewed the current status of, of wildcats. And that's um, a, a freely available um, a publication, the, the Wildcat Status Review. And um, so anybody can read it. Um, and, and they looked at the data that we were collect, collecting, and, and they came up with them. Um, essentially two recommendations and and that was that one uh, the wildcat the wild living wildcat population in Scotland should be regarded as non-viable and that if um, wildcats are to be uh, are to be saved or recovered in the wild then it's got to be through a uh, reinforcement or reintroduction and you know a lot of times in conservation we focus on what what is the number and you know, I could I could give you numbers and, and so on. You could see, my goodness, that's low or that's high and so on. But a lot of the time we don't have an accurate number. But when but quite often um, instead of an accurate number, we get quite an accurate idea of the trend of the population. So is it increasing, is it decreasing, is it close to extinction based on the evidence and so on? And that's really what we have with the wildcat. We have that that term that non-viable and that's a really critical term for wildcats because it means that there's possibly some wildcats out there in the wild but there's not enough of them across Scotland that they can they can be a self-sustaining population even if we went out and carried out all the um the threat reduction we we could possibly do in the wild there's still not enough wildcats for there to be a self-sustaining population 
So if that's the case, the only thing that you can do is to put more wildcats out there. Um, and that, that really changed the approach on wildcat conservation. So Scottish Wildcat Action uh, came to an end in 2019. And just before it ended, we decided to look at what is the next phase of wildcat conservation? What does it look like? Yeah. And you know, after the re review by the IUCN, it, it was very, very clear that there was only one solution, and that was to put more wildcats back into the wild. So we decided um, RZSS um, in partnership with um, Nature Scott, Forestry and Land Scotland, Cairngorm National Park Authority, um, Northern Zark Zoo in Sweden, who specialise in native uh, species restoration, and Junta de Andalusia, who are the regional um, government of Andalusia and who lead the Iberian Lynx Recovery Project. We all partnered up and decided to apply for a European Life Grant um, for a six-year project, um, which of course is, is Saving Wildcats, which focuses on creating viable populations of wildcats in the highlands of Scotland by captive breeding and releasing them into the wild. Um, and that's, that's really where we are. Um, and so, like I say, Scottish Wildcat Action helped us get to the stage. And I think without that data that we collected, um, amongst the many other great things that the project did, without that data, we would probably still be showing pictures of wildcats saying, look how good our conservation work is because we've got a camera picture, a camera track picture of a wildcat. And that's not enough. That we know for wildcat conservation, you can't just look and say we're conserving wildcats because we've got a picture of one. So we had to change the approach. So that's the good thing really though about, about your or, or, or Scottish Wildcat Action and Saving Wildcats approach to conservation actually, because you you whilst maybe on the on the on the face of it, you could look at Scottish Wildcat Action and and it'd be really disappointing and, and say, look, we we turned out basically we found hardly any actual wildcats out there and you could look at that oh no you know absolutely awful news that is but you you've made that into an adaptable kind of positive solution out of that and and club together and thought right what's next you know we're not we're not giving up um we've got to kind of protect this species as is how do we do that so it makes complete sense so really this this genetic test has been the, the game changer right i mean that's 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 really helped kind of set things in its course it has it's, it, it's played it's played a, a really significant role um in probably the last four or five years um both it, you know pr predominantly in the wild but um it's a tool that we've also been using with the the captive breeding program um here here in the park and at other collections across the, the uk to make sure that the, the captive population of wildcats that we have um, can be a really, really valuable conservation support tool. Um, obviously, when it comes to field work, um, you know, you can put camera traps up and you can, you can get images of all different animals that are um, in the area. Um, but what you, can't, what you can't do is you can't get an instantaneous genetic sample and an instantaneous result. You know, the, the genetic test is quite complex. The sample has to go to our lab in Edinburgh. Um, but it takes a bit of time. So it's one of these things where, you know, practically it's difficult to make instantaneous decisions um, when you're talking about the genetic test. Of course, you can do that with images. Um, you, you can do, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you get a camera trap of a cat, then you can make a decision or you can sort of allow that information to, to help you do your next logical step um, the same day, but with genetic genetic samples, you can't. Um, but I think um, we use it as, as one of many tools. And I think that's, you know, in terms of uh, our, our conservation project and conservation of wildcats um, full stop is that we have a toolbox. And, and in that toolbox, we have a selection of tools. Um, the captive breeding program is a tool. The camera trap surveys that we do is a tool. The genetic test is a tool. Um, the analysis work um, that the field team do uh, is a tool. The outreach and engagement is it. So we have this suite of tools. And, you know, on their own, there's a few of those tools that are going to save a species. But collectively, that toolbox 
um, can really make a big difference. And, and as you say, the, the genetic test has been a really critical one in the last few years. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, I suppose the last few years as well, is it that same kind of genetic test that has actually kind of, you know, discovered that the, the Scottish wildcat, I suppose, it isn't, isn't actually a thing. And it's, it's really kind of European wildcats in Scotland, right? So they are the same species as, as wildcats on the continent. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't actually the, the, the hybrid sort of genetic test that, um, that, that led to that conclusion. There was some work in, in 2017 um, led by um, a, a sort of taxonomy um, specialist group who were um, commissioned by the IUCN to review the taxonomy of the, the entire cat family. And that's when the, the number of um, species in the cat family and number of subspecies in the cat family and um, went from 37 species up to 41 species. And I think the subspecies changed from something like 280 to about 77. So there was, and, and of course, you know, as, as you mentioned, the more, the more technology gets involved and the more our, our tools change over time, um, the, our understanding of, you know, um, species ecology, populations, distribution, and um, taxonomy, it changes. And we can't yeah. get away from that. And, and conservation is always evolving and adapting. So during that piece of work, which was led by Andrew Kitchener, the National Museum of, of Scotland, um, they reviewed the, the, the data, the evidence that suggested historically that um, wildcats in Scotland were a separate subspecies. And, you know, many people would refer to them as Phila sylvestris grampia, but there's there's simply not enough evidence um, for that, for, for the, the, the Scottish wildcat to be regarded as a subspecies. So um, it was the subspecies during that review of the cat family was rejected and um, Phila sylvestris sylvestris is the European mainland wildcat and the population of wildcats that we have here in the UK. It so doesn't that, mean, it, it, sorry, James, I was just going to say, it doesn't mean that as a population, it's not critically um, important and the, the, the sort of, uh, conservation needs between Scotland and Europe can't be different. Um, but it just means that, you know, you go back 10,000 years, 12,000 years, and, and the population we have here would have been connected to the, the European population and the European gene flow. So that kind of goes on to my next question, really, because I suppose if if the kind of the wildcats we have here are the same species um, as those on the continent, um, why not kind of translocate on mass kind of, you know, wildcats from the continent over here? Is there... What's the benefit of, of breeding for release over uh, over kind of straight up translocation, so to speak? Well, you're 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 absolutely right. That that's really your two options. Um, I think I think first of all, regardless of whatever option, you know, somebody or a project was to look at, um, I think it's fair. I think everybody would probably agree that we want to keep as many of the Scottish genes that we've got here in the population because. Mm -hmm. 10, 12,000 years that the population in the UK was separated from the mainland European population is, is quite a long period of time, you know, not, not in terms of um, a, an isolated population change, you know, um, adapts so much that it, it becomes a different species, um, but it's still a, a decent enough period of time that there can be localized adaptations to a different environment, a different climate, maybe a different prey base. So we want to capture any of those um, local adaptations by retaining as, as much of the, the Scottish genes as we can. Um, but there's definitely, definitely a role um, for European cats to help boost that population in Scotland. So as you say, there's, sort of, there's two options, really, when, when your last resort is to put more animals out in the wild. You could, um, well, there's actually three options. You could look for wild-to-wild -wild translocation, so you could go to Europe, get a bunch of animals and bring them back and release them. Um, you could look at um, breeding in captivity and releasing, or you could look at breeding in captivity um, and bringing some in from Europe and breeding and releasing. So there's actually three strategies there. Um, and Saving Wildcats um, has opted for the, the breeding and uh, the breeding of, of animals that we've got in captivity and 
uh, releasing and uh, looking at the potential of bringing in some cats from Europe as well to help boost the gene pool. Well, so that, that makes sense. That's like from from kind of even though uh, i guess scottish wildcat got maybe downgraded so, so to speak from kind of a subspecies as you say there are kind of traits in the population that that means that one day you know hundred thousands sorry thousands of years down the line that that could become again a, a, a kind of subspecies with its slightly different traits and slightly different looks and slightly different behaviors so it is worth trying to conserve those as much as possible yeah, I mean, we, we don't know how the population is going to change. We don't know what new tools will be devised further down the line. But what we do know is that if you've got a population, regardless of how endangered it is, um, and you're trying to recover it, you want to keep as much of that population as possible yeah. whilst adding what is necessary to, to save it. Um, and just to touch on what, one of your, sort of other, your, your questions about could you not just go to Europe and, and get a bunch of animals? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an option. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people, when we talk about that as a solution, it sounds quite straightforward. Let's just go to Europe. Let's just get a bunch of animals, bring them back, and we'll release them. Bob's your so, uncle. Say again, James? Bob's your uncle. Problem yeah, solved. <laughs> easy, done. So, I mean, if we explore that a little bit deeper, um, and, and bearing in mind one of the, the, the objectives for saving wildcats is to release, is to create a viable population by releasing 20 animals per year each year for, for at least a, uh, until 2026. So if we, if we were to take that number and say, okay, we need to go to Europe and we need to catch 20 wild living wildcats, I'm sure you would, you would agree that that is a difficult starting point, going to another country and, and finding out where the cats are, and then cage trapping, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of expenses. You're going to have to pay other teams in the, the country and so on and so forth. So catching 20 wildcats will be difficult for a start. Um, but once you've, once you've got those 20 animals, um, if, they're not, if they're not from different populations, so you've moved across a country or from country to country, you're going to have brothers, sisters, aunties, grannies, if you've been trapping all in the one area. So you have to trap in multiple locations at the same time so that you get a good gene diversity in the population. And then you, you probably, you know, if, if we say the lifespan of a wildcat in the wild is probably between eight and 10, and that's being optimistic. Um, and, and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get, they'll probably become close to post-reproductive at nine or 10. You're not going to want to bring old cats because you want to create a new population and have it reproducing. So you probably won't want to bring any six or seven or eight or nine year olds. Yeah. So of those 20 animals you've captured, you're going to have to check their age, which is, is going to be very, very difficult to do, but you can estimate their age and you want to get put, release the, the older ones. And then you're going to have to keep trapping until you get younger ones. And then if you get 80%, if you get 18 females and two males, well, that's no good because you yeah, want to yeah. try and have a balance. So it's actually much more complicated than people think. And once you've got the 20 wild caught animals, when they get to Scotland or the UK, you're going to have to put them in 20 quarantine enclosures for three months for rabies quarantine. Yeah, yeah. And there's nowhere, there's nowhere that I could tell you right now that could do that. So no, either I mean, way, you're going, to, you're going to have to build a facility of some kind. That makes complete sense now, actually. I mean, you know, once you've kind of said that, um, especially about kind of, moving around and having to get different individuals from different places, it makes complete sense that you've got so much more control through captive breeding. And, and I know that you're kind of the stud bookkeeper as well, aren't you, for, for wildcats in, in, in the UK. So it, it makes complete sense for you to be actually be able to say, right, you know, you go off for a date with you, you go off for a date with you and be able to completely kind of control the genetics of that population rather than sticking a net out in, in Europe somewhere and, and hoping for the best. I know that's not the way to do it, but, you know, that yeah. does make much more sense. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's absolutely not without its challenges. I mean, obviously, one of, the, one of the benefits you would get if you're bringing wild animals is that they've, all of their wild behaviours are, you know, second nature. They're, they're right there because they've been living wild. One of the big challenges that we get when we're using captive animals is that um, we, we, we need to try and sort of fine tune their behaviors. And, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a believer that, um, you know, cats in general, they, they, they have all of those wild behaviors tucked away. Um, 
if they don't use them for a long time, then um, they, they, they need to develop them more. But I, I, I believe, and from all my experience working with cats, I, I see those wild behaviours come out every now and again. But it's a bit like riding your bike. I mean, maybe when you were 15 or so, James, I don't know what you're like with a bike now, but I imagine when you were 15, you were doing wheelies and stunts and stuff like that. But now you might not be doing that because you've not been on your BMX or bike doing stunts for 20 odd years. I've come um, back to stabilizers. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, I, I think it's, you know, um, again, perhaps that's an oversimplification, but I think that's similar to behaviors that if they're not using the wild behaviors on a regular basis, then they need fine tuned, they need trained. Mm. Um, and that's a big part of our work. Um, so as, as you know, we've um, one of the, the activities for the project is, is, is developing a dedicated conservation breeding for release center where we can breed wild cats away from human disturbance and then we can move them into big, large natural enclosures. And that's where we'll really develop their skills so that we can do our best to make sure the animals have got the life skills that they'll need for, for life in the wild. Um, and as you mentioned, the control element with, with captive breeding um, is one of the, 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 the pluses, one of the big benefits of using a captive population. And you actually, there's numerous recovery projects across Europe and globally that are actually moving more towards using captive populations than they are towards wild to wild because you've got, it's more sustainable and it's got, it's got much more control. So tell me about this. You mentioned it briefly, but you know, your project was somewhat inspired by the Siberian lynx <laughs> Um, program, the, you know, probably one of the most successful conservation initiatives in, in modern times. And I, I think from talking to you previously, you, you went over there and kind of had a look at that. Um, so how's that, how's that come about? Tell me about how, how and why that was so successful and, and, and what you're kind of hoping to, to bring over from that project. Well, I mean, I think um, many of, of the listeners, and, and I know you know, know the project, um, uh, very well, James, but, you know, the, the Iberian Lynx Recovery Project is, is incredible. Um, it's arguably the most successful carnivore uh, recovery project um, ever, full stop. Um, you know, the Iberian Lynx, um, I think in early early 2000s, was, was, there was two populations, two small fragmented populations. There's no subspecies of Iberian Lynx. Um, there's just the population in Spain and Portugal. It's a single... Um, uh, species, um, there, there's no other countries that have it. If you lose that population, you've lost the cat. And at the time, there was actually basically no Iberian lynx in captivity, so there was no fallback. So the population was about 90, and they, 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 both Spain and Portugal agreed that they did not want to lose their, their, art, their, their incredibly iconic um, cat. So they embarked upon this recovery project, which um, where they, they needed to capture some of the remaining wild lynx, build dedicated breeding centers, breed them, um, and then release them back into the wild. And they've done that for the last 15, 20 years. And they've now got four breeding centers. Um, they've got incredible protocols. The data collection and documentation of the process is, is, um, is fantastic. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's Iberian lynx all over Spain and Portugal now. They're breeding everywhere. The population is over a thousand. Um, uh, I think it's, it, it went from being um, critically endangered um, down to, it was, it was the only species of the cat family that was critically endangered, the only species. Um, and it went from critically endangered to endangered. And now I believe it's, it's probably going to go down to vulnerable as well. So it's you know, it's, it's incredible, um, but the journey rang so many similarities with wildcats and the approach that we could take that um, when we, we visited there, and I've, I've worked with colleagues from the, the centers for several years, when we went there, it was that one of those sort of light bulb moment, moments that sort of, you thought, well, why can't we do this for wildcats? Uh, so it's an amazing story to, to hear about, and it, it, it can fill you with a lot of, uh, hope and inspiration at a time when we've got, you know, biodiversity loss across, across the whole globe and, and in the middle of a climate crisis and things like that. We need more stories like the Iberian Lynx. So, uh, you know, hats off to you guys. And I really hope that it kind of continues in that sense. Um, you mentioned again, briefly in, in another answer, but I'll just touch on it a bit more. Um, so we get a bit more emphasis on it, but um, how many cats are you kind of hoping to release over 
how many years and whereabouts are they headed and, and why have you chosen those areas? So, as I mentioned, we were aiming to, um, as of 2023, um, we're aiming to release 20 cats per year um, over the duration of this project, which, which runs to 2026. Um, so that's, that's the target. Um, we're currently carrying out uh, field um, uh, assessments. We've got an incredible um, field team that's led by um, Kerry Langridge, who uh, was one of the project officers in the previous project. Um, and she's got an incredible team un under her and they're doing a, a huge number of surveys in, in um, currently in the Badenoch in Strasperia on the, um, on the south side of the Spey in the National Park. Um, and they're doing camera trapping, small prey surveys, um, uh, and they've been, you know, looking at the looking at habitat mapping as well, and, and you know, assessing that area as a, as a potential release site. Um, and you know, we when we were developing the project, we looked at a number of sites across Scotland, and I think this idea that you know, let's wait until we find the perfect site. I don't think I don't think it's about that. I don't think there is a perfect site. I think there's pros and cons to everywhere. Uh, I think it's about finding somewhere that's suitable um, and that, that has, you know, good habitat, good land management, low, low um, sort of risk of threats. Um, and there's so many factors to take into account with where is a good place to release animals. Um, you know, if you think about it, you could find somewhere that, somewhere that has incredible habitat, um, incredible um, prey base, um, but there's huge roads and there's maybe um, land management activities um, surrounding that area that just doesn't, you know, isn't conducive to trying to start a, a new population. So, you know, we've worked um, for several years with um, uh, different landowners, different communities um, in the National Park. And, and actually, the National Park was the site of one of the first um, wildcat conservation projects, the Highland Tiger project. So. It's, it's been sort of at the forefront of the wildcat discussion for, for, for many, many years. And um, it was, it's, the Cairngorms has been considered one of the last strongholds for, for the wildcats. Um, so there's many, many advantages, but um, you know, we go through a very thorough process. We can't just say, right, we want to release them there. And we take down our white van at night and open the back door. We, we don't do that. We, um, there's you know guide, guidelines that we have to follow. There's assessments that we have to follow. There's licensing that we have to follow. So we work with all the right um, uh, organisations and follow the best practice. But but of course we want to carry out these assessments. We want to know that it's an appropriate area for wildcats. Um, so hopefully it, it could be the um, the Badenoch and Stras area of, of the the national park, but. Um, we, we won't be able to sort of answer that until we've got, we've, our, Kerry and our team have re reviewed the data, but um, there's a huge amount of work going on, um, even, even in, uh, through the winter months, which is actually some of the, the better survey um, periods, especially for camera trapping, that horrendous conditions, as you know, that we get up here in, in the National Park, but um, the, uh, the field team were out there day after day. So there's some really exciting data and I'm sure once it's been analyzed and processed um, you know it, it will be uh, publicly available at some point in the future but fingers crossed that the uh, that we, it can be the it can be um, a positive area for the release site but we, we don't know just now so I'll just ask a, a couple more questions Dave and then we'll we'll move on to some of the audience questions because I can see some um, coming in so I'd like to leave a bit of time for those um, so if I mean if we've obviously talked about like hybridization being a, an issue and it's and it's still being an issue, so how are we gonna how are we gonna avoid this being a a, a issue as soon as they're released? Is it is it throwing them to to immediate uh, genetic dilution or you know what's the what's the kind of take on that as soon as they get released? What, how are we solving that issue? Well, I think this is, you know, for a wildcat, for the future of wildcats, I think it's one of the million dollar questions, you know, what about ongoing hybridization? Um, and one of, one of the reasons um, we're looking at the, the you know, sort of the, the south side of uh, Badenoch and Stras Bay um, is that we feel there's actually some natural sort of semi-natural barriers um, 
for between you know the creating a new wildcat population and, and perhaps some of the villages where maybe feral or domestic cats could could come from. Um, but the the approach that, that we'll take is is um, the field team are carrying out their assessments. If they come across feral or hybrid cats, um, then they'll they'll conduct trap, neuter, vaccinate, and release so that those animals a can't breed with wildcats and b can't pass on uh, diseases. We'll be doing a huge amount of community work um, to encourage anybody in, in the local area, in fact, anybody across Scotland that has a, a domestic cat to make sure it's, um, it's vaccinated, it's neutered, it's microchipped. Um, because, you know, this, this, the, the vision is that we want wildcats back across Scotland everywhere. So we, it's a message that we, that we want to pass on to everybody. But, um, you know, move, moving forward from that, you know, we've, we've got to hope that there's some bigger changes in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, how we manage uh, domestic cats or responsible cat ownership. And then on the opposite side of that, how we, how we conserve a species like the wildcat. I mean, that's probably my, my final kind of question. And it, and it is a, it's a hard one, you know, you, you're dealing with um, lots of people and, and, and a nation of pet lovers as well. But, you know, whilst we can, as you say, kind of control to some degree feral cats that are unneutered wandering around because you can trap them when you get up, kind of hold them, you can neuter them. And yes, you know, you can encourage pet owners to, to be responsible. But are we going far enough with that? Is it is it is it a case between, has it got to the crux of it where it's actually, you know, can we have a viable wild uh, wildcat population alongside people keeping unneutered pet cats that can kind of wander out when they when they want? It's a hard question, but you know, we're in a, we're in a biodiversity emergency. Um, do we need to take a bit of a harder line on that? You know, do we need to be I don't know campaigning government to change the laws, especially in these in these priority areas? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I... I think there's definitely definitely an element of that. I mean, it's not th this project isn't sort of um, the the main driver of it is is not lobbying and government. It, it's about trying to find a solution to bringing wildcats back and, and creating a new viable population. Um, and over the next five years of of this project, we definitely hope that a lot of the work that we do will will indicate that there's a solution to bringing wildcats back. However, um, alongside that solution, there's got to come other changes um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, nutrient vaccination legislation around microchipping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, th I think we would, we would all, all agree on that um, because that's always to the benefit of the wildcat. And as you say, we're a nation of cat lovers. And if that's the case, then whilst we have pet cats and so on, we should all want the wildcat to thrive. And um, so I definitely think, you know, it's not a question of can, do we, is it on one hand we have the wildcat or on the other hand we have pet cats. I think we can have, we can have it all, but I think we've all got to play our role. Um, and, and hopefully there could be some um, legislation further down the road that, that can tighten that up. But um, there's no getting away from the fact that Scotland has a, a feral cat um, issue, as many countries do. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it will be uh, detrimental to the wildcat if it isn't addressed somehow over the, the next few years. And just to finish, uh, James, that I think it's really important that, you know, there's many partners in, in this project and, uh, you know, we've got a breeding centre here and so on and so forth. But ultimately, these cats are going to be released back into the wild and, and these cats are going to be the community's cats as much as they are ours. Um, and hopefully the communities around wherever we do release these, these wild cats will take ownership and will want those animals to thrive um, and, and will play their role in, um, you know, uh, with responsible cat ownership and helping us uh, tackle the problem um, of you know, crossbreeding or disease transfer, um, et cetera. That would be incredibly helpful, and a really fantastic way for the community to play a role. So what you're saying, Dave, is that, um we can't act as individuals as pet owners we need to see the big picture nicely tied in <laughs> yeah i think you finished that off i still think the buckaroo analogy was a bit better but no. <laughs> yeah. yeah i'll i'll try again i'll try again next time <laughs>
Right, I better fire through some audience ones. So if you can keep your answers fairly brief so we can we can address um, a number of these. Um, there's, I've, I've piled a, a few into one because it's kind of um, been asked several times, but where, where does the original genetic code come from? Is there, is there one animal we're, we're measuring against that's, that's you know, 100% pure? Are we, are we keeping that as the, the prime, prime cat? Uh, no, there's a huge reference base um, for, the genetic, um, for the genetic test and the development of the genetic test. And it was, um, it included uh, numerous wild caught cats from, from Scotland, cats from Europe, cats from the, the captive breeding program and huge number of historic specimens um, in the museum. And um, so it gets, it, it gets a, a very wide um, scoping sort of reference base. Um, I think to do it all with one individual cat wouldn't, wouldn't really be wise in scientific terms. Okay, great. Um, Matthew Hay asks, uh, how important has the decline in native woodland and scrub habitats been for Scotland's wildcats? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't say specifically um, uh, the, the role that it's played um, or to, to what degree it's, it's had an impact, but I, I would definitely say it has. I mean, there's, there's no getting away from the fact that um, wildcats enjoy sort of a diverse mosaic habitat, um, grassland, shrubland, edge habitat, um, and you know that, that that's that's decreased um, pro in the last few decades. I'm, I'm sure um, uh, that's that's decreased. Um, and you know there's there's many sort of plantations and, and so on that, that aren't so favourable for wildcats. So um, what what is quite optimistic for wildcats and many many other species is is the number of um, restoration habitat restoration projects and, and landscape scale projects. That hopefully in the next 5, 10, 20 years will have a huge impact and we'll see more of that diverse habitat come back. Okay, a uh, good question coming in from uh, Naomi. Um, and it's kind of a, on kind of what we do, kind of communications. Um, so she's saying, um, just curious on our thoughts as to why the plight of the Scottish wildcat seems to lack in awareness or publicized, uh, public, publication, kind of why, why don't people know about it? Um, I'm not actually too sure. Um, it's a very good question. I, I think uh, with many, many small felids that are elusive, very difficult to study, very rarely seen, uh, research and awareness is actually much more difficult. Um, you know, and, and if you look at the cat family, almost all of the publications, the research projects, um, and, and actually, uh, most of the funding goes towards the, the five big cat species and um, the 36 other species get a very small, small share. But I, I definitely think the sort of elusiveness and remoteness of, of the small cat um, is part of the issue. But I think historically, we've just somehow we missed, we missed the, sort of the start of the decline of wildcats. Um, and it just wasn't wasn't as apparent as some of the other species we that became endangered. Um, but now I think we have an incredible opportunity to improve people's education understanding because at, at the most basic level, how do you conserve something that, that you know nothing about? So it's important that we do all of the research and engage with communities and improve our, our education so that we can then do more impactful uh, conservation action. I think actually, like from my own opinion, I think I think uh, conservation communications is something that's been kind of sidelined historically um, from a lot of kind of organisations and initiatives, and it's it's kind of a sometimes it has been an afterthought. You know, we've we've done all this great science, but you know, do the general public want to read a, a, a ten thousand word paper? Probably not. But I think now we're really getting into the crux of it, where people are are realising that communications are equally as important as the science and getting that across to people for people to buy into it and action their own kind of um yeah points to make and, and stuff like that so it's i think the tide is turning on on that kind of conservation communication and getting the issues out there and importantly the solutions next question from luke uh, metcalf is how does the saving wildcats project tie in uh, with the wider restoration ecology and wilding agendas. So, you know, you've, you've mentioned some of your partners that you're working with. Is it is it hand in hand with kind of habitat um, habitat restoration at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like I would like to think so. I, I think um, 
as I think as John Muir said, if everything's connected. You, t- you tug at one thing, you're tugging at everything else. Um, and, you know, I think the, the wildcat um, is an important part of, um, of the ecosystems um, here in the Highlands. Um, and there's, as I mentioned, there's many habitat landscape scale restoration projects. And um, as, as the habitat is changing and coming back and more diverse, we want our, our native fauna to be in there. We want that, that healthy ecosystem. There's no point having you know, all of the habitat, but none of the wild species to occupy it and then get that sort of, uh, that, that balance in the ecosystem. Um, so unfortunately at the moment, you know, as habitat is coming back, wildcats will not, will not fill it themselves because it, it's a population um, that's so close to extinction. So hopefully as we, as we bring them back, they can um, play the role and, and benefit um, a lot of these other, other projects. Um, that are occurring at the moment. So, you know, we, we don't we don't specifically um, collaborate with other projects just yet. But I think um, inadvertently there, there's going to be so much uh, crossover and, and overlap that um, wildcats will sort of indirectly play their role in many other projects in the future. So, last couple of questions before we let you go. Um, so, this is quite a, a long one with various things, but. Um, do you anticipate a self-sustaining population in the national park by 2026? Um, presumably due to the fragmented habitat, it's unlikely the national park population would disperse far enough to breed. So is the long-term goal to undertake further releases in other areas, um, e.g. Caithness, Ardemirk, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so I think that there's two there's two questions there. And, and to answer the first one about um, uh, is this sort of objective to have a viable self-sustaining population, um, then, then yes, the, the, that's, that's essentially the goal. Um, you know, we, there's work being done which um, indicates that, that a, a small but viable population of wildcats could be um, 40 individuals. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to release 20 animals per year. Um, for three years, at, at least in this phase of the project, uh, we expect that there will be reproduction, there will be deaths, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there will be dispersal. Um, but at the end of that, we, we hope that as a minimum, there will be um, a population of, of 40 left. Um, now, of course, it's very easy to, to sort of write that, that uh, uh, equation almost on, on paper. In, in reality, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Um, but we, we do hope that we can create what essentially is the start of a, a viable population. Um, and the, the project will definitely not end in 2026. Uh, the partners are, are all very much committed to, to moving much further beyond that with commitments to wildcat conservation. And um, as we all know, you, know you, you don't recover and save a species in five years. You, you don't, it's 10 or 20 years. So I think it's fair to say we're all in this for the long haul. Um, but the, the, this first phase of, of uh, long-term wildcat recovery is, is critical that we get the processes um, and the technique right so that we can replicate it further down uh, the, the road and, and hopefully in other locations too. I'm sure you could go on for this final question from the audience um, for ages, but you've got 30 seconds. Um, so <laughs> Impossible. <is> there, <laughs> beyond kind of trap neuter release of domestic cats or the, the uh, feral cats, what can people do that are watching to help? You know, a lot of people will care about wildcats. How can they? How can they help as the general public? Well, I mean, I think as you said, education is critical. So, liking, sharing, um, articles you see about wildcats, re, you know, um, exploring the SavingWildcats.org.uk website, learning about the species, learning about the project, learning about conservation efforts. Um, if you want to play a direct role, you can um, uh, donate to the project. Um, there may be opportunities further down the line for people to get involved and um, uh, volunteer or, or uh, remotely get involved. Um, and, you know, I, I have to go back and say, if you are local or if you're in Scotland and you have a pet cat, if that cat is vaccinated and neutered and microchipped, you're already supporting wildcat conservation. Um, so the more they do that, the, the better. But um, like, share, donate, um, just learn about the species and do what you can to, to support wildcat conservation. And I assure you it will be uh, um, greatly appreciated from our end.
Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight, Dave. It was definitely informative and inspiring, and I truly uh, wish you the best of luck and hope that it is as successful, if not more successful, than the Iberian Lynx programme. We're all really rooting behind you there. Um, and the final question kind of came on, um, you know, onto what we're doing at Scotland Big Picture here. And we are often asked how people can get involved with rewilding and, and play their part. But we split this into three kind of simple um, take home measures. The first one being wild your space. Um, so whether you've got a garden, a windowsill, uh, a school, a schoolyard, a public space, an allotment, wild it, make it better for uh, local ecosystems, for, for biodiversity gains. The second is make some noise. So sign petitions, as Dave was saying there, talk to people, um, get onto socials and, and talk about rewilding and how other people can get involved. Um, as one of the questions alluded there, you know, people don't always know about this stuff. So speak to family and friends about it and get it, get it on the agenda. And the final one is quite simply put your money to work. You know, there's lots of environmental initiatives out there, Saving Wildcats being one, Scotland the Picture being another, and many, many others that might be close to your heart as well. Support them with your money, buy their products. You know, every pound you spend, even when you're buying products out there, it's, it's a vote in the right direction. Make sure you're doing it in a sustainable way and doing it for organisations that are improving nature for Scotland and the rest of the UK. But thanks very much for joining us. And that's all for tonight. Cheers.